This is the 2019 Lexus LX570, and it is the ultimate Lexus SUV. Now, that's a big deal because Lexus has five of them now. There's the little UX, and then the NX, and then the RX, and then the GX, and then there's this, the king of the hill with a big V8 and a starting price of around $90,000. Unfortunately, this is also a disappointment, and today I'm going to review it and explain why. First, a little overview on the LX. Now, this is Lexus's flagship SUV, and it always has been, ever since it came out in 1996 as the LX450. Back then, it was just a thinly disguised Toyota Land Cruiser with Lexus badges, but things have changed over the years. The LX has now taken on an identity of its own with a very different look from the Land Cruiser, both inside and out. And yet, underneath, it's still pretty similar. The LX shares its platform with the Toyota Land Cruiser, which is a good thing because the Land Cruiser is known for reliability and longevity. The LX also shares the Land Cruiser's engine, which is a 5.7 liter V8 that makes about 380 horsepower and around 400 pound-feet of torque. Those are robust numbers, but they come at the expense of fuel economy. This thing gets 13 miles per gallon city and 18 miles per gallon high highway, which is among the worst of any modern SUV. And then there's the drawback of age. Now, the current Lexus LX570, this one, came out way back in 2008, and it is ancient compared to all the other full-size luxury SUVs like the Range Rover or the new Lincoln Navigator. But Lexus has done a pretty good job of keeping it current with style upgrades and a lot of modern technology that's been added along the way. And today, I'm going to show you that. First, I'm going to take you on a tour of the LX570, and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the LX570, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've rounded up a list of the best preserved old Lexus models currently listed for sale on Autotrader. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features in the most noticeable place of the LX, and that would be up front with the grill. Now, Lexus's grill has been a little controversial. Most regular people don't really mind it. A lot of the complaints about it come from car enthusiasts who hate any kind of change. Let's go back to manual transmissions and leaded gas and bias ply tires. Personally, I think Lexus's grill looks really good on the sedans and the smaller SUVs, but this <laughs> is absolutely ridiculous looking. The grill is way too big, too ungainly. It looks like a cartoon, vastly overstyled, a truly, truly terrible look in the front of this car. It doesn't work, and they really should figure out something else. The sad part is, when the LX570 first came out back in 2008, the Lexus grill fit on there pretty well, but since then it's gotten bigger and bigger and uglier and uglier, and this is, I guess, the ultimate iteration of this grill. Grill. It just doesn't look that good. Now, adding to the overstyled front end of this car is the fog lights. You can see the fog lights are on now, and they're just this little circle of fog light, but they have this giant boomerang shaped fog light housing. Why? It's all just wasted space, but more styling that was unnecessary in order to make this thing look grillier, I guess. Now, next we move on to the interior of the LX570, and I have to say it looks a lot better in here than up there. And in fact, the interior, just from looking at it, you really wouldn't be able to tell that this hails from 2008. It's been updated very well since then. The materials all look very nice, top notch. Everything looks and feels good to touch. It really works even in the modern era compared to modern rivals. But when you start poking around and playing with buttons and features and screens in the LX, it does start to show its age pretty dramatically. For example, in the gauge cluster of a brand new Audi, it's a full screen and you can get it to show a satellite Google Maps view of where you are in your navigation destination. In this thing, there's a tiny little screen with a compass. <laughs> That's as good as it gets for 95 grand. Audi will sell you that feature in an A4 for like $40,000. 
this thing's double the price and way, way worse. And that's just unacceptable in 2019 at this price point. In fact, the fact that the LX has physical dials in the gauge cluster at all is an example of its age compared to modern rivals that have screens in the gauge cluster, which allow for more configurability and you can kind of pick and choose what you want to see there. Fixed gauges are out. But anyway, within the gauge cluster, there are a couple of interesting quirks and features, starting with the language choice. You go in there and you can see your first option is English, and then in parentheses, American. <laughs> in big capital letters. Just in case you're one of those people who doesn't want to admit you speak English and instead, no, I speak American. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. Obviously, it's there to distinguish it from British English or Australian English, although it's worth noting those aren't options. So it could just say English, but instead it does say American in addition. Another interesting item in that gauge cluster screen, if you scroll through to vehicle info, it provides your tire pressure. It's pretty standard. It also provides the tire pressure for the spare, <laughs> which is kind of above and beyond, frankly. I actually had a Range Rover that did this too, and when the spare was low, it would turn on the tire pressure warning light, which was endlessly annoying. Hope this doesn't do that, but I wouldn't be surprised if it does since it's monitoring it. Now, next we move on to the center control stack where you have a series of buttons, and this is a fairly normal center control stack, mostly the climate controls in here and nothing particularly interesting. My favorite button though is climate concierge. You press that and it goes above and beyond regular automatic climate control because it even turns the seats onto automatic climate control. So if you want it to be 70 degrees, it will blow out air to be 70 degrees, but also perfectly position the temperature of the seat heaters or coolers to make sure that even your butt is at the right temperature. That is the benefit of climate concierge, and that is pretty cool. But when you move down from the center control stack and into the center console, you can see a few more areas where this old LX really starts to show its age compared to newer rivals. One good example is the gear selector, which is this big clunky thing you move between gears. That used to be common, but modern rivals are now moving to push buttons, to column shifters, in order to free up more space in the center console area. But the LX has this giant old gear lever that takes up a lot of space. Now the drawback there is, that means the cup holders get pushed up and away into the corner and they're very, very small. Not good enough for a lot of big drinks you might get. And if you put a drink in them, you'll block access to the climate controls. It's just a bad use of space. Same Deal with a wireless phone charger. Instead of being able to put it easily reachable in the center console, it's behind this door at the bottom of the center control stack where it's totally out of reach. You put your phone in there to charge it, you will almost certainly forget it when you park your car and go inside your house or your office. Now, I admit one feature I love here in the center console, if you open up the center console storage, it isn't just storage, it can also be used as a cool box, sort of like a refrigerator if you want to keep a sandwich cold or something while you're driving along. That is a pretty cool feature. One thing I love about the cool box is that if you open up the lid, there's this little information label describing the cool box, and it's printed in three languages English, Russian, and Arabic. So perfect. Boy, does Lexus know the market for the LX570. Those areas are exactly where this thing sells and pretty much nowhere else. Now, next up, another item taking up a lot of space here in the center console is all the buttons and dials for the off-roading stuff. This vehicle is a fairly capable off-roader and it has a lot of cool accessories like crawl control, which is an awesome feature. It's like an off-road cruise control system. You can also lock the differential here. You can put it in low range. My personal favorite though is the one that will raise and lower the suspension. I absolutely love how fast it lowers. Check this out. That footage is not sped up. This thing lowers like as fast as the Ford GT does when it goes into sport mode. I don't know why it needs to lower so quickly, but it does. Now, next up, the last thing taking up space here in the center console is the remote touch interface controller. It's this leather padded thing with this like joystick on top, and it controls the infotainment system although not very well. Now, I used to be a big fan of Lexus's remote touch interface. I thought it was a great feature when it first came out. It was like using a computer mouse. You would kind of move around and then click on what you wanted. But in the years since remote touch has come out, many other automakers have done many better things. And the latest infotainment systems from Mercedes-Benz, from Volvo, from Audi, Land Rover, are a massive step up over remote touch. And getting in this car and using this after using some of those other systems for a while, I can't believe that Lexus is still doing this 
to its customers. Let me give you an example. I'm in the navigation screen and I want to go see Tyler Hoover's house in Wichita. Now in a normal system, you would just pinch to unzoom and then kind of move it over with your finger and then pinch to zoom back in and it would take seconds to find Wichita. Not so in the remote touch interface. You go down and you unzoom for a little while, you zoom out and then oh, we're in the middle of the ocean. And then we have to kind of try to move ourselves over using the little joystick into the Midwest. And then you kind of have to figure out generally where you are. Again, with a normal system, you would just be swiping your fingers and zooming in. But anyway, you kind of get to the Wichita area and then you got to scroll down to zoom and go in a couple. Then you got to kind of go back and center it better and then zoom in a couple more. And it actually took me over a minute just to get into the Wichita metropolitan area when when I was doing this, truly a terrible design and oh does it get worse. Check this out. I am on a general list of items and I want to scroll down. Well you can't just go to the bottom of the list and have it scroll down. You have to actually highlight the little down scrolly item in the screen. The problem with that is the remote touch controller is too sensitive and it doesn't really allow you to easily click on that and you often find yourself going too far or not far enough which is tremendously annoying. But my all-time favorite annoyance with remote touch is entering a navigation destination. In an Audi or a BMW, you can just write where you want to go with your finger on a pad and it puts it on the screen. In this thing, no, no, you have to go letter by letter using this remote touch controller. A, B, C, and that's assuming that it finds each letter because again, it's too sensitive and it goes past the letter you want and then you click on it and you just have to hope for the best. Lexus did this to try to keep your eyes on the road so you could just feel the feedback and look at the screen right next to the windshield and the road in front of you, but it is so poorly done that it has the opposite effect. I can't imagine how many hundreds of millions of dollars Lexus has spent developing remote touch interface it was all wasted and Lexus should just get into a brand new Mercedes or Audi, look how it is correctly done, and then change this immediately. But anyway, my remote touch interface rant is now over. I used to give that system the benefit of the doubt for a long time, even in reviews I filmed, um, but modern systems have just gotten so much better. Getting in this is like getting in a car from the mid to late 2000s all over again. They gotta change this. But anyway, <laughs> moving on. A couple interesting quirks and features of the infotainment system. One is that you can set the park assist distance for when it starts beeping. So if you're a really bad driver, you can set the parking beepers to start beeping sooner to let you know you're about to hit something. And you can configure that based on how confident you are in your parking abilities. I love that. And another cool feature in this infotainment system is it shows you the weather in your area. You can look at like a three day. You can also look at weather in many other areas, national, local cities. You can check different areas of the country. Here's a list, for instance, of the southeast. I would love to scroll down, but unfortunately I can't make it over to the down scrolly icon. It keeps going somewhere else. So I will just have to make do with the weather in the cities that are alphabetically first on this list. Now, next up, we move on to the back seat of the LX570, which is a nice place to spend time. You climb in here, and the first thing you notice are these leather covers on the backs of the front seat, which look very nice, and they say Lexus on them. So you're thinking, is this like a book or something? No, no, you pull off the cover and it reveals individual screens for the rear seat passengers. And check this out, the screens actually swivel so you can put them exactly at your eye line, which is pretty good. And surprisingly few screens for rear passengers actually do that, but it's nice to see it. Now you look at these screens and you see these little icons on it. It's right in front of your face. You're thinking finally a touch screen in here. But no, it could be a touchscreen, it looks like a touchscreen, should be a touchscreen, but it isn't. Instead, you control this screen using a remote found here in the center armrest, which drops down. You can flip the remote to L or R, and when you do that, it controls obviously the left or right screen, depending which setting you have it on. And then you can choose which icon you want and select all the various different things. And that's how you work the screen in the back of the LX. And by the way, yet another kind of old school feature back here beyond the non-touch screen screens. There's no panoramic sunroof in this thing. It's amazing to spend $95,000 on a modern luxury SUV 
and not even have that available, but that's the world you're living in if you get an LX570. With that said, something I absolutely love back here, in this center console, you have the climate controls, and obviously you can adjust them. Each rear passenger has their own zone, but the coolest part is, once again, you have heated and cooled seats, and once again, you have automatic seats. So you adjust it to 70 degrees, it won't just blow out air at 70, but it will perfectly cool or heat your seat to get to exactly the temperature you want. Automatic heated and cooled rear seat climate control. That's something you only get in this vehicle. And next up, one other item I really like back here in the second row is that the seats are power operated. There are little buttons on either side of the split bench. You press it and it will automatically move the seat forward or backwards, which is a nice touch in an expensive SUV, and it is not necessarily a touch that every one of this car's rivals offers. And speaking of moving the seats back here, next up I wanna talk about getting into the third row of seats in the LX570, which is really, really easy. There's a little lever close to the door, you just pull it, and then the seat back folds down, and then the seat automatically folds forward, and that makes access to the third row really, really simple. And so, as usual, I will do it now. Pull the lever, seat goes forward, tons of space, and you can just climb in. Now, obviously, this would be a little bit easier if I was smaller, which is, of course, the intended clientele for the third row. But nonetheless, I can get back here without all that much trouble, which is pretty good thanks to how far forward this seat comes. Now, I will say, once you're in the third row, space is really, really tight back here, tighter than in some smaller SUVs. The biggest problem is the floor because there's all sorts of important off-roading components underneath this seat. The floor is really high up, and so there's really nowhere for you to put your feet. So legroom is really at a premium back here. The third row in this vehicle is pretty much only reserved for children or maybe adults for very short periods of time. And speaking of the third row, let's move around to the back of the LX570 where you will find yet another old school feature, namely the tailgate is only half power. The upper half of the tailgate opens up automatically, but the lower half is manual. Now, you might think it's very difficult to get two sections of tailgate to both power open and close, and I'm sure it is, but the Range Rover also has a split tailgate and both sections are power. But in this one, you have to manually open this part. Not a huge deal, but again, $95,000. Now, once you're back here, you will notice that there's not an enormous amount of cargo room. That's pretty standard for three row SUVs behind the third row. In order to get more space, you have to fold down the third row of seats. The problem is that in this vehicle, unlike in most other full-size SUVs, the third row doesn't fold flat. Instead, you have to fold down the seat and then it folds up against the rear windows in order to get out of the space in the cargo area so you can put stuff in. Now, the reason the LX570 folds the third row of seats up against the window is once again because it has like all sorts of off-roading hardware and a spare tire underneath these seats so they can't fold flat. This used to be a common thing, folding the seats up against the window, but no one is doing it anymore except for this vehicle and the Toyota Land Cruiser. But Lexus has an interesting trick up its sleeve when it comes to folding these seats. To fold them down, you pull in this little strap, you push, and they fold. That's really simple. Now from there, you would have to pull it up and it's heavy to get it up against the window, but you can also just push a button and then the seat will automatically rise up against the window. And that is a pretty cool touch. It means that you don't really have to do anything. Now it is worth noting you can do the same thing on either side. So with the left seat, you just fold it down and then once again, press the button and the seat will automatically fold up against the window. And that gives you a flat cargo floor, although these seats are still in place just onto the side, they take up a little bit of cargo space. Now, one thing worth noting, you can also drop the seat back using little buttons back here. If you press the button, the seat back will fall right down, but you can only drop it. It's not power folding back up like it is in so many other luxury SUVs. And finally, we move up to the LX570's engine. It's giant 5.7 liter V8, 380 horsepower, 400 pound feet of torque, and it is a blessing and a curse. It's a blessing for two reasons. Number one is obvious, reliability. Unlike the modern turbo V6s where we're not really sure about longevity, this is just a big old relatively unstressed V8 that they've been making for ages 
and it's really reliable. And that leads to the second benefit, which is resale value. As these LX570s start to get old, they become really popular in the off-roading community because of how reliable it is and how far you can take it into the wilderness without worrying if you're going to get back. And that keeps resale value really high. For proof, go and look at what a 2008 Range Rover costs around 10 grand and then look at what a 2008 LX costs it'll be around 30 grand and the reason for that is they're just so desirable because people know they will last forever but of course the drawback of a big old school V8 is fuel economy. This thing gets 13 city, 18 highway, abysmal ratings by modern standards. By comparison, the new Lincoln Navigator gets 16 city and 23 highway, more than 20% better city and highway, which wouldn't be such a big deal, except that the Navigator has 70 more horsepower and 100 more pound-feet of torque. So the Navigator gets more than 20% more power and it has more than 20% better fuel economy. And that should be a sign to Lexus that it is very much time to do something a little different with the LX570. And so those are the quirks and features of the Lexus LX570. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the LX570. Uh, first thing you notice driving this is that even on the road, it, it has an old school feel to it. It feels very ponderous. If you spent time in a Range Rover, you'll know it feels surprisingly tight and surprisingly stable considering its size. You feel like you wouldn't be scared driving that thing 100, 120 miles an hour. This is a little bit different. Um, it definitely feels more floaty. It feels softer. It just doesn't feel as stable. Now, the funny thing, of course, is we know this is much better built than a Range Rover. Um, but it doesn't have the feel of a more solid car. It's just more reliable. Now, I will say some benefits to the LX. The uh, driving position is fantastic, very tall. Um, a lot of even full-size modern luxury SUVs are starting to go more crossover. They don't quite feel as kind of king of the road. Certainly, I feel that way about the Range Rover compared to older ones. Uh, this does still feel tall. It feels like you're sitting above everyone. And that is something you, most people look for when they're buying something like this. It's also very quiet in here, although not quite as quiet as I think some of the rivals. It is very comfortable in here though, and I think maybe even more comfortable than its rivals. It is amazing to me how much this thing neutralizes the bumps on the lane lines. In my Mercedes, it's like, it hurts going over them. In this thing, you don't even feel them, um, which is probably not very safe, but it does a really, really good job. One really big gripe I have, uh, the transmission is just laughably slow, slow to respond in any situation. There's a sport mode, but it's not very effective in a vehicle like this, and um, the transmission is just very slow, very dull. Now, I think there's a reason for that. I think it's intended to be kind of slow and dull so that uh, you know gear changes are basically imperceptible, and that, that is the case. You can barely feel them, but whew. Uh, floor it and you're waiting a little bit. You better not have pulled out in front of somebody. Truthfully, I hate to say this, I really do, but this is uh, the biggest disappointment car that I've reviewed this year. And I say that because I love the Toyota Land Cruiser, uh, which this car is based on. And I reviewed one last year, earlier this year, and I loved it. Um, and there's some rumors the Land Cruiser is gonna go away. And I'm like, well, that's okay. You know, I could just get an LX. Um, and now I'm in this and I'm like, I don't really want an LX. You're putting up with a lot of stuff that just is not very good compared to rivals. And for the same money, uh, people are gonna watch this and say, well, I don't want a screen in my gauge cluster. I don't, I don't want a push button transmission lever. Yeah, well, if you were spending 95, you would. You would want everything to be the nicest, the best, the newest, the most modern. It's an enormous amount of money. And to get this car that doesn't have a panoramic sunroof, I, uh, it's a really hard sell at that price point. This is a very competitive market segment. I knew going in based on its age, it might not be so great, but I thought maybe its toughness and its durability would win me over, but it doesn't. I've spent too much time in these full-size luxury SUVs to get in this and think it's good. It's just too far behind, especially for the money. And it really, the only benefits here are Lexus customer service, resale value, reliability, which is sort of the things that all Lexuses have. Uh, otherwise, get a Range Rover, get a Navigator, get a G-Wagon. Don't even consider one of these. Uh, you won't like it. It's, it could very much be better. 
and I hope that a new one is coming soon. It should have been here three years ago. And so that's the Lexus LX570. This thing is ancient, and it feels like it on the road. And considering how popular SUVs and luxury SUVs are right now, it's a huge missed opportunity that Lexus hasn't given us a new, fully redesigned LX570. These are notoriously durable and reliable, and they come with the excellent customer service you get from a Lexus dealership. But it's easy to see that more modern rivals offer a better SUV. And with that, it's time to give the LX570 a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the LX570 is bad. There's no other way to put it. It's just bad. I happen to think this is probably the ugliest new car on sale. It's not as grotesque as some older models, but it's close and it gets a 3 out of 10. Acceleration does 0 to 60 in 7 seconds, which barely squeaks it into a 2 out of 10. Handling is slow, ponderous, and soft, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is low. It's not enjoyable to accelerate or take around corners, but it is impressively capable off-road, which helps a bit, and it earns a 4 out of 10. Cool factor is okay. These are revered by some, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 17 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It's relatively well equipped, missing a few things, but mostly it has what you want in this class, and it gets a 7 out of 10. Comfort is pretty good, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Quality is very high, the interior is nice, and reliability is massively high. It gets a 9 out of 10, and it stops just short of a 10 due to some older interior materials. Practicality is high, with 3 row seating and excellent off road capabilities, and it gets a 9 out of 10, again, just shy of a 10. This this time due to fuel economy. Finally, value, and it's just overpriced for most shoppers. Some will appreciate the reliability and the longevity, but generally it's just too old for this kind of money, and it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total daily score of 38 out of 50. Add it up and the Doug score is 55 out of 100, which places it here among other full-size luxury SUVs. Dead last, below even its sibling, the Toyota Land Cruiser. The LX570 was great when it came out, and used ones are still great, but I can't really understand why anyone would buy this new when so many better options exist. Nobody is doing it anymore except for this and the Toyota Land Cruiser. But Lexus has an interesting trick up its sleeve. To fold down the seats, you pull on this little strap. <laughs> That's Lexus's trick. <laughs>